uh, I think we are going to start uh, with uh, today's uh, webinar. So good morning, good afternoon. So uh, I would like to welcome all of you and thank you for your interest in today's talk. My name is Andre Kone. I'm a teacher of English at the University of Letters and Human Science of Bamako. It is an honor and a privilege for me to moderate today's webinar. Our university, the ULSHB, is relatively young, 10 years of existence. However, it has developed a fruitful cooperation with other universities and organizations, including the AAP Consortium, because we believe in international cooperation, especially in the domain of education, learning from others, sharing experience with them, organizing and participating in conferences, colloquiums, etc. Being a university with limited resources, we appreciate the funding, scholarship, training we receive from the MSU. Our university teachers, technical staff, and students are well committed to play their parts in the partnership with the AAP Consortium. It is, therefore, not surprising that two of our, two of our four speakers of today's meeting are from the ULSHB. So to begin with this session, let's give honor where honor is due. Professor Idrissa Traore will have the floor for his opening remark. Five minutes for him. Then the panel discussion will start. Ten minutes. Uh, well, we, it, it's now. Uh, let me. That was scheduled to be at 8.10 with speaker one, Professor Kamara, an excellent artist, humanist, and philosopher. So we'll discover him together. Kamara, you will have 10 minutes for your intervention. Then Safina Kimbo Kota will also have 10 minutes. After her, Mr. Mamadou Habib Balo from uh, UET will follow 10 minutes. And after Mamadou Balo, Mr. Philippe Effion from the MSU will take the floor. He has 10 minutes too. So at 8.50, there will be a session, a question and answer sessions. At 9.25, the closing remarks. And then at 9.30, the end of this dialogue. So I hope you will enjoy our talk of today. And I know that teachers, artists, and others like to, to speak, to talk. However, because of time constraints, we have one hour and 30 minutes. So the time constraint uh, won't allow us to elaborate too much on what we have to say. So I would urge you, I will urge the speakers to respect the time allocated to them. Thank you. So now let us give the floor to Professor Idrissa Soiba Traori. Professor, you have the floor. <clears throat> Professor Traori. Andre, it seems he's been disconnected. Yeah, and even I cannot see uh, Burema Konate. No, so you may. So, um, we may just have to move to the next. Yeah, I think we'll move to uh, the first speaker, uh, Professor Kamara. Umar Kamara will start with uh, you because uh, our VC is not available yet. <clears throat> so you can see Professor Kamara's biography. Professor of Arts. Well, Doko, je vous remercie, hein? uh, thank you all for having me, for taking some time to come to participate in this event, to listen to what we have to say on this panel. The topic that I would like to share with you this morning is 
the issue of notion of concept and its effigy in art, what terminology for peace. But before anything, I would like to explain what we mean by notion of concept, so that whatever follows next is more uh, digestible. So the concept, uh, as you may see it on the screen, is represented is a mental general mental representation of some of, of a thing that representation refers to an image a picture you may proceed please proceed with this slide thank you in other words the idea that we have of a thing may lead to a real representation of that thing but the real representation of that thing is now absolutely in line with its mental representation in other words with the idea of a representation which it's which it reflects i'm, I'm going to give you an example when i say when i talk about, when i say a cat immediately the represent the mental representative of a cat will be uh encrench entrenched in your mind but when i ask you to each and every one of you to represent that cat each and every one of you will be drawing uh, their cat uh, uh, how they see it because the mental representation of a cat at a, with Amy is not the same as with the cat represented with Mr. Konate or with, uh, someone else. That's why we're saying that art is a form of social conscience. It's a reflection of the environment we are living in and where the artist is living in. When you ask uh, for an African child who was born in an African village and, uh, to draw a um, house, uh, most probably that child would be drawing a hut. And when you ask the same question to a child who is in Europe, he or she will be drawing a house with a story building. This is a brief introduction. I wanted to have us so that really the pictures that we'll be projecting uh, um, can allow us to better understand that notion of um, um, this concept. Since here uh, today, we are talking about um, art and peace. The pictures that I've picked, that I've selected for you pertain to peace. Let's proceed. Inspirations and artistic creations, please proceed. Here you have the Berlin Wall. This Berlin Wall is seen is by Westerners as being the wall of shame. It was considered by Eastern country people um, to be a peace wall. So you have the same representation, but uh, two different judgments. Let's proceed. Please proceed. Next slide, thank you. Now, this is also the Berlin Wall, the start is the change, it's mutation. You can see the barbed wires are coming out. Please proceed. Here, once again, this is the Berlin Wall that I call the comic face of history, because you uh, think I said that uh, history has two uh, faces, the tragic and the comic faces, but the comic face really allows you to really get out of the tragic face of history. So you can see here an act of um, um, aggression on the wall, against the wall, but it's also um, an act of liberation that will lead to the creation of mon monumental works of art um, devoted to peace. Next, please. And so this will lead to this monumental wall like this one. And the Berlin Wall is seen here, is seen as being the peace wall. Thank you. Proceed. We have the picture here of Guernica. Please proceed. This is a, a Pablo Picasso you're familiar with that was uh, done in 1937 during the bombardment of uh, the Basque city in Spain. Uh, Picasso, um, uh, during three months, uh, really established, created this monumental work of art for peace, which is a message of peace and hope. You can see here uh, on the horses, uh, the uh, bodies on, on the earth, etc. Next slide, please. So it's a piece of art that creates a message that gives a message to um, humanity. It's against war, also a message of peace and um, hope. Uh, so Guernica has become really a universal symbol of peace, which looks into the war devastations, etc. Let's, let's proceed. Next slide, please. We will ask uh, Picasso in 1949 
during the um, global uh, congress um, of uh, Australian peace in Paris to present um, something on peace. And he got inspiration from um, uh, doughs um, uh, in a cage and through the liberation of this dough that gave him really the idea of really uh, producing uh, this work of art in a figurative uh, way. And uh, that's why this work of art is uh, seen this way. But he stylized the vision. I'm going to show you that uh, stylized version in the next slide. The next slide, please, for the stylized version of this uh, dove by Picasso. It's talking about peace done by um, Picasso. You're all familiar with the world. The world is familiar with this picture. Next slide, please. Okay, next slide, please. Here we can see um, um, Ligier Richer's work of art that represents a skeleton, uh, which is completely decomposed, which is uh, taking out its heart uh, from his body and to show it to God. Let's proceed. I have a text I've written. We'll read that very rapidly. The text I've written on this. Next slide, please. It's a, it's a structure in a form of a skeleton uh, with uh, rotten flesh, with a uh, hand raised and a heart being uh, given to God. It's a symbol of resistance in the face of dangers that are threatening humanity against wars and natural disasters. Next slide, please. Here you have um, the Takuba. It's a Tuareg sword. It's a symbol of peace and honor. The, um, um, there's a saying that said that a slaves do keep the hurdle and the Takubas say their honor. So it's similar to this um, saying that said that when you want peace, you have to prepare for war. Thank you. Let's have the next slide. This um, uh, sword by, was used by the backhand forces in Mali. And so these uh, sort of imposed swords are the logotype type of Barkan and so the back and forces, I can't see the writings there. Sorry, I can't see. It's been uh, deleted a little bit. So this um, sword really um, will take uh, the uh, Malian forces. Uh, please, you have two more minutes. Uh, I can't see, uh, I can't see uh, the lower end. Let's proceed, let's proceed, no problem. Now here, okay, it's a bit slow. Takuba also was interpreted by the Prime Minister of Mali that has been selected not just by chance. Europeans are trying to divide Mali. So the same concept was seen differently, interpreted differently from other sides. Uh, let's proceed. So this is um, uh, the picture of peace. Um, Abdullah Kanati is a Malian artist. So he's saying no against religious fundamentalism. Let's proceed. And make it snappy because these are the same pictures anyway. These are swords we use. And so Abdullah Kanati is against Islamic fundamental in Northern Mali. These are blood drops on um, those are really uh, poured uh, by people and also so this um, represents really uh, people who are really seeking peace. Uh, because it's not going very fast as I wished anyway. You're right, yeah, but anyway. Another piece by Ablai Konate, the blue uh, symbolizes promise. The blue moon. Okay, here we have, sorry. The slide is going very late. Yeah, ah. his time is over. Because the, the person who is um, uh, really, it's going too slowly because I cannot make um, the comments as I wish. So we'll proceed, okay. But anyway, we'll show the pictures uh, very rapidly. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to make any comments. So, uh, so this is a crowd, a source of inspiration. Okay, just go ahead. This is a crowd which is uh, really seen in Berlin. 
uh, also. Uh, they say in Mali, the same crowd, um, seen differently, um, different inspiration. So the um, Murta Monument in Mali, this is a work of art by my friend Reta Lusaget. It's a symphony for peace done by an Ethiopian painter. Mori Kante, um, um, you're familiar with this gentleman. He's been invited by John Pope Sakan. He was wearing white and he, he was told that only Pope could be uh, could wear white clothes. But then Pope said, no, he, Mori Kante is a Mandinga Guya, maybe he's Muslim, but we're all uh, children of Abraham. And this is a true message for peace. This is a um, uh, mythical balafon of um, it was great. It's a um, unifying symbol of the Mandinga people. The last two, this is a piece of art I produced in 2016. It's called Gwenen, uh, the Immaculate White. Uh, Salif Kate, um, um, he says his heart is good and his heart is pure as the pureness of the, the Immaculate heroes that uh, resembles uh, the dove of Picasso and the last piece of art. Um, he came and um, kneeled uh, next uh, to his father to come and apologize. It's a peace message. I hope uh, that uh, this will be symbol for all of us. Uh, may God help us all. Thank you. Excellent presentation. So, uh, <laughs> Safina, Safina, Safina has with me for her presentation. She has 10 minutes. Safina, please. Thank you so much. Uh, as I've said before, I am Safina Kimbokota from uh, University of Dar es Salaam at the Creative Arts Department. I really do appreciate uh, the, organiz uh, the organizing team for inviting me to this discussion. And today talks, uh, the topic of my today's talk is Art and Peace as a Tanzanian sculptor's uh, perspective. <coughs> Uh, I'll cover four uh, topics. Uh, the first one will be the introduction, uh, the modern Makonde sculpture movement, and then the four major styles of modern Makonde sculptures, and last will be the conclusions. Uh, <clears throat> the papers argue that uh, peace, which is a money in Swahili language, is not only the absence of war, but a significant ingredient for freedom of expression. The paper will attempt to prove this statement in the context of artistic production in Tanzania, especially in modern Makonde sculpture, which is my area of concentration. Throughout post-colonial period, art has flourished without the interference of political suppressions in Tanzania. And this has led to the emergence of local schools and movements in visual arts. However, the creation of the Ministry of Culture and Youth by the late President Julius Kambarage Nyerere, the first president of Tanzania, stimulated artistic production by providing market institutions uh, in the country, such as uh, and because there are several institutions that uh, uh, were, were there to promote the, the, the visual arts in the country, such as uh, Nyumba Asana, uh, the Ministry of National Culture and Youth, and also the Art and Craft Department, the National Museum of Tanzania. And also there are some individuals who also uh, play part in uh, promoting and uh, uh, promoting the, 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 the visual arts scene in Tanzania, including the Mohamed Pira, who are the curio shop uh, at the center of the city. <clears throat> it is against this background that uh, the present paper will concern itself. The discussion will be focused on, on modern Makonde sculpture movement, which is a homegrown in that it was not created by Western mentors, like other movements that uh, we know in Africa, such as, the, such as the Oshobogo Experiment School in Nigeria and the Shona Sculpture Movement in Northern Laodicea, known as Zimbabwe. Now, when you look at the modern Makonde Sculpture Movement was formed by the immigrant Makonde sculptors 
who settled in Tanzania in the early 1950s. And these Makonde immigrants came from the Mueda village in northern Mozambique, bordering Luvuma, <coughs> Luvuma River in Makonde Plateau. Mueda was inaccessible because it was surrounded by thick forests full of wild animals. And this was an advantage to these Makonde people because their culture was not corrupted through contact with foreign visitors, <clears throat> like their neighbors in Newala and in Tuala in Tanzanian side. They decorated their bodies with incised tattoos. Their teeth were fouled and women had lip plugs. <clears throat> the neighbors called them Wamawia, the fans. According to Kingdom, 2002, the first, <clears throat> the first Modern uh, sculpture was carved in 1931 in Imula village by <clears throat> Nyekenya Nangundu and he moved to the capital of Mozambique, now known as Maputo. The last of the young cavers were inspired and called out the art of carving in other destinations, including Tanzania and other parts in the world. Though the majority of the cavers settled and worked in a Saiso estate in Tanga region in Tanzania. The peace that prevailed in Tanzania was a strong motivation for artistic production of wood sculptures. While the first sculptures by <coughs> Nangundu was realistic in style, was created in Tanzania, which became more complex in form and content. We should now discuss Thus, the most important styles that formed the legacy of former Conde masters. This is a, a map which is showing places where the Makonde settled in Tanzania. So as we look at uh, uh, the map, we see there's a, this place is Simtuala and Newala. Uh, the first style that uh, I would like to ask is the Ujama style. And uh, <clears throat> the piece that prevailed in Tanzania in the early 1960s includes positive culture policy, which charged in the establishment of the Ministry of Youth and Culture. This ministry stimulated sculpture production within the country. And the first patron of, Ma of modern Makonde sculpture was a local businessman by the name of Mohamed Pera, who established a curio shop in, this, in the art of the city of, the, of Dar es Salaam, which is the main city in Tanzania. So Pera invited local cavers to work in the backyard of his shop and sold the artwork to tourists. The first created Makonde sculpture who he made from, this, from his collections was Robert Jacobo Sangwani, who created a style characterized by a class of figures. Safina has two minutes left. <laughs> two with, minutes one figure, left. with one figure at the top called the Mongo, meaning power of strength. And Sangwani told Pila that the sculpture was inspired by whistling much among the Makonde, in which the winner was called Child High. But uh, uh, because of the time, I would like to invite you to watch a video which shows the, uh, the figures of uh, the, uh, the, the four styles that I have mentioned before. And this was part of my uh, online exhibition that I did last year. Can you play the video, please? Have you ever met someone who is always on the move? You wanna win this leave? That's a fitting description of the Makonde. 
Though it is said that they moved around in search of employment, one would rather believe that it was in search of inspiration for their breathtaking art. Makonde are originally from southern Tanzania and northern Mozambique. They are renowned for their prowess in wood carving. They elaborate mask and figuring recount generation stories. Dimongo. Dimongo means a power of strength, which is locally political zealot later named it Ujama, was introduced by late Robert Yakobo Sangwani, who migrated into Tanzania from Mozambique in the late 1950s. The original style represented a winner in a wrestling match who was carried shoulder high by his colleagues, represented in a cluster of figures. Shetani. Shetani was created by Samaki Likankowa in the 1960s. There are different theories regarding the fact that he brought about this kind of style. The most common one comes from the patron of Samaki, Mohamed Pera, who used to sell most of the work produced in the L1960s to the L1970s. According to Pera, Samaki brought to him a realistic carving that had accidentally fell down and split into two halves leaving one eye, one ear, one nose opening, one leg and one arm on each half. Pera suggested to Samaki to attempt carving a sculpture with a single body part. Samaki agreed and he brought the work to Pera's shop, which was immediately sold and he was encouraged to carve some more. And then Mawingu. Clemens Ngala was discouraged by Pira to copy Samaki's style. He came up with an original style which he called Mawingu. So Clemens then came up with an original carving of a human-like figure without a face wearing a kind of headdress. In his right hand, which was raised, and in his left hand, which was lowered, it held the earth. Final, we come to a master sculptor. Chanuo Maundu, who came up with four styles named Giligia, Kimbulumbulu, Mandandosa, and Tumba Tumba, all inspired by traditional beliefs. Giligia is characterized by a figure with large protruding eye and frightening teeth that project outside. This sculpture is based on the fear experienced when one walks alone in the forest. Kimbolombolo features in an abstract format a large eye, nose, and mouth carved and placed not in their normal positions, legs from a form that resemble a head. Kimbolombolo appeared in the L99s, an anthropomorphic sculpture that displays Fajo. It is a sculpture that represents a person with a nervous behavior who does not complete things properly. The Makonde word kumbuluka, a nervous behavior, is where the sculptor so fit to base his creation. Mandandosa style represents an evil spirit that is kept by a soccer to do harms to victims in society. In the old days, when the Makonde were involved in family vendetta, the Mandandosa were used as a sacred weapons. The sculpture is characterized by a single large eye that was used in spying on enemy dwellings. Tumba Tumba style, which Chauno introduced in the mid 1980s. This style is dominated by a god like structure that is decorated with incised pattern resembling the tattoo the Makon puts on their bodies. This exhibition was inspired by Professor Elias Jengo article, background of the Makon. So in uh, conclusion to this, uh, we have seen that the Tanzanian's peaceful uh, environment has made it possible for the cavers who came up with uh, distinct styles and uh, which some of them were not even Tanzanian, they came from Mozambique. And uh, it is through this uh, peace environment that Tanzania has been able uh, to have artists to enjoy freedom of their expressions that made it possible for the mention to have a modern Makonde movement with the patrons uh, from all over the world, but also concerning the Western influence in the formation of Tanzania and for Tanzanian art movement. We have seen that the modern Makonde sculptures movement, uh, uh, Chama Sawata, which is the union of modern Makonde 
have never been laid by a Western mentor. It's just uh, the uh, artists themselves. Can, can and lastly, not conclude, please? Okay, time, time lastly, yeah. Lastly, the police of reliance uh, in many human endeavors has helped many organizations to be self-reliant without the external assistance. And in this way, art organization looked inside their cultures for direction. Thank you so much. Thank you, Safina. So uh, it took uh, four hours, uh, four, I mean four minutes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I did four minutes to your time. I'm, uh, and, I'm sorry uh, for Amara that. Did, Amara did not have that privilege. So let us move to uh, Mamadou Abib Balo. Balo, please, you have the floor. <clears throat> Balo, merci try bien. not, to, merci, try merci not to take more bien. than 10 minutes. Que, euh, oui, merci beaucoup. Oh, thank you. I'll try to make it very quick. Otherwise, I'll be uh, left behind. Anyway, now, concerning the outline that you can see displayed, yeah, the commitment of artists. I cannot see uh, the title he's reading. This is reality. It's a reality because I'm an art graphist. I've been a student in the past. I've been a young person it's in the past. So now it's not very easy to do this kind of work. Things are that the current youth has a devotion for uh, artistic creation. There is no market for that. There is no market for this kind of business. But still, um, they're trying their level best to really find their route. This is being promoted by the creation of um, high school of art which has many partners in the region and even elsewhere in Europe that come in and um, every month we receive some of those or they come and facilitate workshops so they gain some um, experience. They, they've been able to really, um, really turn it into a real trade. So it's an art is a trade for them with many programs and then you have, I'm trying to find the right word. Then there's been a foundation that we call a festival in Niger, which is um, uh, supported by a patron who is supporting uh, these uh, young artists through the creation of workshop, um, workshops in order to promote resilience. During those workshops, the foreigners are coming to uh, interact with students and they create together. So, all this left to the dedication for this in the youth uh, group. Now they create and uh, they create workshops. They go and rent an apartment and then they settle there and they do, do their work and then they pay monthly rent. So if these are large places, they work together, they create and they exhibit their production and then invite the larger population to come and see. Uh, their work, despite the fact that they know it's not really the poor generation that are work uh, that are buying these goods. Goods are being purchased by foreigners, Westerners. So, um, so these people still remain uh, embarking this field because they love it. I've been uh, really urging my students really to keep on uh, doing this kind of work. They've graduated from the uh, conservatory um, school um, by city. Also, there's something with the National Institute of uh, Media um, was established many years back. And um, the uh, graduates have got together and are working together. They created a workshop that they called Bajalan Workshop. You may go and visit that uh, place they create together. It's not always easy for them to create works of art, but they are trying really to be, um, they go to homes and uh, various places and um, uh, try and work, uh, sell their work of art. So these uh, young people I'm talking about, 
uh, people graduate from the uh, Conservatoire des Arts uh, the, that has a different uh, department, plastic arts, uh, multimedia department, um, uh, department of visual arts, and also infography, et cetera, et cetera. They also have a, a drama, dancing, uh, and design uh, units. So this is quite, um, this gives more spaces uh, to those students. They give them more opportunity to really be heard and seen and to encounter other uh, artists um, uh, coming from far and wide. So they want to really keep on doing the work uh, together in a common manner. I think they've been doing well. These are the people who are now, uh, there's one of those I would like to introduce, his name is Kebe, who is very prominent. He was uh, in France recently. And there's another girl who's doing photography also. She's, uh, she's been getting awards uh, from many places. I think this is really a start, a good start, really, uh, for us young. Um, uh, entities. So these were the challenges that uh, really students were um, uh, facing, uh, faced with. I think the foundation on um, um, and, and Nisha has done a lot, have been really very supportive, has been helping uh, students to so they can work together. Uh, uh, all classes are working hand in hand, and then they decide to create their own workshop and uh, really uh, uh, there are many uh, young workshops and their galleries um, are being supported by this foundation. They are very enthusiastic and these uh, young groups and uh, so they build these exhibition sites and um, in order to project and um, exhibit their works of art. In all times, uh, I think uh, things were uh, a lot easier. Now it's uh, tougher for younger generation to really get success in the art world. Uh, let me proceed now. Now art and peace um, and the connection between peace and its reflection in African art. Let me proceed, sorry. It's just a segue. So, sorry. Here, I just want to interpret the book, work of art, this piece. Uh, I'm not in the slide, it's not really, I'm a bit lost because I cannot see really the right slide. Can you uh, proceed? I think uh, because uh, I'm not really uh, commenting. Uh, uh, so this uh, photograph is connected to issues of accountability and ethics. I'm not comparing. I'm not saying that there's an opposition to war. Um, I think uh, artists at any time are consolidating peace at any time. Whatever they create are meant to really promoting peace. Um, they're trying to magnify peace um, and consolidate peace in general. Um, through it, so um, I think, uh, so next slides are showing this, uh, you understand better what peace means really, what peace entails. Because when you talk about peace, you have to think about war, uh, time also. The first slide, can I, can I get back to the first slide? The first slide, um, it's not really uh, matching my talk anyway. So the first slide, okay. This is a painter, I think. Umar Kamara we talked about this uh, painter. He's an artist. He's very famous, he's a major artist. He works on many uh, topics. These are his uh, latest uh, works of art called uh, The Bees. Balak. Two minutes left. I'll go uh, make it very snappy now. So it's his sensitivity uh, that's coming out. So he's very sensitive to colors. And I went to visit his home where he's uh, exhibiting his works of art. This was the sense I had of a strong sense. It's as if I was in a room. In the room of where, full of melody and music. It was fantastic. Anyway, it's colors that uh, really uh, music entails sounds. Now, we proceed with the slides. Well, let's proceed. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Here, Ibrahim Kebe, Bemba Kebe, um, he got inspiration from 
uh, traditional secret society we call the Karaduga. They have a role to play I mean, for training of a younger generation for tomorrow. They have a role. Uh, they try to calm any tension that may uh, really arrive in our society, in the community. So this it's a role of wisdom that they are projecting and they're promoting. So uh, Quebec got inspiration from that because uh, younger generations are not aware of our tradition, our history, but when they discover um, this uh, really, um, they uh, trying to project all those. So he uh, had an installation with with the sculptures. Uh, it's an installation. So many pieces of art that are uh, exhibited, that are uh, seen, they work in a combined manner. They try to collect um, uh, um, iron, uh, uh, crafts, etc., and then they turn it into works of art. So this calls for wisdom. And this is, um, uh, let's proceed. Um, now, Mariam Nyare. Mariam Nyare, uh, the young girl, um, uh, she's 23, 24. My memory serves me right. One minute, one minute to make, can make it. Okay. So, okay. Uh, since she was young, when she, whenever she sees the albinos, uh, you know, she was really feeling uh, uneasy. Um, so she said, why are we uh, mistreating those albinos? And that's why she, she's been working on this um, um, uh, topic. Whenever you see a pregnant woman, she will uh, really uh, look away in order to, uh, when she's pregnant, she will look away in order to uh, make sure that uh, her child will not become albino. The lady you can see here that uh, is a queen. She doesn't have really, uh, she has a uh, scepter. Uh, you can see uh, the golden uh, fabrics. This um, magnifies uh, uh, kinship. Uh, this is a promotion of albinos. Um, uh, let's proceed. Uh, next slide, please. She, she said, this is a beautiful um, uh, albino. She, she, um, she's doing the pictures and the question that let's proceed. Let's proceed. Next slide, please. She's sitting there next to uh, the prince, an albino prince. She, she called this gentleman the prince. The role here of this picture is to promote these people, these albinos, so that people can really be better accepted in societies at large. Because they have uh, human, human beings. And so during the exhibition, we had many albinos who were present there, and um, they were very happy to see that their uh, um, problem was being uh, defended. Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay. You can see it's very serious. Even mothers who are really delivering children, when there's an albino next door, they will just uh, really um, turn a blind eye. But in this picture, she is really uh, uh, um, uh, watching her mother and just to show that these are human beings and should not be discarded and uh, taken out of uh, human vision. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And then she gets isolated and uh, she's, um, uh, as you can see the uh, aesthetic composition of this picture, it's really telling. And then the topic of suicide and albinism, the next slide, it's coming very slowly. She decided really to um, go and commit suicide with this rope. That's the final picture, Balo. I think I'm done. I can conclude just to say in in peace artists have their work their role to play in other words you know the albinos you know uh, you have this from all over the place in, in certain regions this is since we have to sensitize populations so that people can really uh, take uh, good care of these people and really uh, integrate them and see them as human beings and not just as really um, uh, 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 um, uh, unacceptable human beings. Uh, Kibi, uh, you know, um, I presented really where we're talking about societies. I would like to say that artists, the artists are very wise. I remember once I was before, next to 
and my home. I swim also by the door and, and the two Russian uh, people uh, who came and wanted to uh, really be fine with me. And then uh, the other, um, um, his colleague showed the uh, sign that said that he was an, I was an artist. And so and the, um, so the, just to say that, that the conscious of sort of being an artist is a good thing. And um, mankind is really, human beings are really good. He wanted to come and really um, give me, a, uh, hit me, but when his uh, colleague said that I was an artist, he just uh, stopped being violent against me. Let us give the floor to uh, Philip Efion for his present, Professor Efion for his presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Can I have uh, a PowerPoint for my presentation? Okay, thank you. And um, my presentation is titled The Audacity of Raw Truth, The Poetry of Dennis Brutus and Chinua Achebe. Now I'll start with uh, the words from uh, a song titled Equal Rights by um, a Jamaican reggae legend known as Peter Tosh. And he says, everyone is crying out for peace. None is crying out for justice. I don't want no peace. I need equal rights and justice. Peter Tosh was not rejecting peace. It was highlighting the fact that peace is unattainable without equal rights and justice. When Dennis Brutus, a South African poet, and Chinua Achebe, a Nigerian Igbo writer, focused on the injustices, brutality, and war crimes of apartheid and the Nigeria Biafra War in their poetry, they echoed Peter Tosh's sentiments but they went further to expose the ugliness of injustice and the denial of equal rights without deodorizing the truth. Next slide. Dennis Brutus was an activist who campaigned against apartheid, sometimes using poetry to publicize its brutality. In his poem, Night Song, City, he uses the following lines to highlight police aggression, and I quote, police cars cockroach through the tunnel streets, violence like a bog infested rag is tossed and fear is imminent. The paradox here is that Brutus ends the poem with the controversial lines, my land, my love, sleep well, which is impossible under the circumstances. The climate of widespread hate, conflict, and violence is evident even in the most basic of activities, which is the thrust of Brutus' poem, The Impregnation of Our Air, where he writes, the impregnation of our air with militarism. We become a bellicose people living in a land at war, a country besieged, the children playing with guns and the schoolboys dream of killings and our men are bloated with bloody thoughts. Next slide, please. Peace and harmony are evidently impossible without equal rights and justice in a racist South Africa, which is a point that Brutus re-emphasizes in his poem, Above Us, Only Sky. Assuming a defiant tone, he writes, after this power, this conquest of brute reality, peace will come. We have the power, the hope, the resolution. Essentially, peace will only come after the brute reality is conquered, which also suggests the need for armed struggle. Next slide, please. Now, though he's best known for his novels, Chino Achebe also wrote short stories, children's stories, and poetry. 
Some of his poems portray gory details of the Nigeria Biafra war, which occurred after the Eastern region or Biafra tried to secede. Achebe is not as metaphorical as Brutus in his portrayal of the horrors of the war. He is more direct. In Air Raid, he presents the shocking details and results of bombs being dropped on Biafra by Soviet acquired bombers. And I quote, it comes so quickly, the bird of death from evil forest of Soviet technology, a man crossing the road to greet a friend is much too slow. His friend caught in halves has other worries now than a friendly handshake at noon. In Refugee Mother and Child, Atebe captures a recurring scenario in Biafra of refugee mothers preparing for the uncertain death of their malnourished children. Next slide. And I quote, the air was heavy with odors of diarrhea of unwashed children with washed out ribs. Other mothers there had long ceased to care, but not this one. She took from their bundle of possessions, a broken comb and combed the rust colored hair left on his skull. In their former life, this was perhaps a little daily act of no consequence before his breakfast and school. Now she did it like putting flowers on a tiny grave. Dennis Brutus and Chinua Achebe underscore the important point, albeit differently, that peace is impossible without equal rights and justice. They emphasize the need to expose in detail the cruelty of injustice, human rights abuse, and war crimes without sanitizing the truth or suppressing raw facts. Graphic details are important because they provoke wider outcries for peace and justice and for villains to be held accountable. This way, victims are honored, greater support is galvanized against repressive systems and peace becomes a possibility. Thank you. And uh, on the next slide, I uh, show uh, my sources of uh, information where I get these poems from. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, so thank you very much, Professor, for this brilliant presentation. And uh, in uh, eight minutes, thank you very much. So uh, before we move to the questions and answer sessions, let us give a floor to Professor uh, Idrissa Soiba, if he is there. Professor, can you hear us? Idrissa? Oui, oui, je vous entends parfaitement. Yes, voilà. I can hear loud and clear. Yes, I can now. Uh, thank you all. I would like to thank Professor Kamara, Professor Balu and Ms. Safina, and Professor Philip Ifyong for their remarks, for their papers that are talking about uh, the place of artists in the construction of peace, the place of artists um, and structures uh, that are fighting for peace, and um, talk about Brutus, ATP, I'm familiar with because I've read those, um, their writings. We believe that this session was a must really, so that we really can be informed on all these issues pertaining to peace. Peace is always an emanation of war and peace has to be constructed for the uh, sake of mankind, ladies and gentlemen, your partners, if you call the participants, our university, University of Malacca is very honored to having been party to this session, this e uh, conference on the um, AAP Alliance for African Partnership. So the topic of today is peace and its reflection in African art. It's a current, it's a topical topic. It um, it uh, raises concerns 
national, national uh, international concerns. So this topic is timely. It tries to give a perspective on issues pertaining to certain disturbances that our humanity is confronted with. From this angle, from the philosophical angle, there have been a very uh, precious information being shared and provided and that been uh, shared with our uh, speakers, that our very competent uh, speakers, um, uh, Safika Kumbo uh, from Dar Salaam University, uh, uh, Philippe Effian from the University of Michigan, thank you, Mr. Barrow, and of course, Professor Kamara from our University of Bamako. Thank you, Andre, for really facilitating this talk. Uh, thank you. I would also like to thank the Felicitation team, those um, uh, supporting this platform. Uh, thanks to all the obviously, community in Bamako that is following this. Um, uh, our students are following this talk with much interest. And this partnership is very key. This multidimensional partnership is very key. This multi-actor partnership is very key. This AP uh, partnership um, is um, very key. A few days back, I was in the U.S. in order to magnify, magnify this uh, cooperation partnership. I'd like to thank the University of Michigan for their leadership. I would like also want to thank each and every one of you. Normally, this is a conference. Uh, this uh, there is going to be another conference um, um, shortly. I've been following all various conferences. I was here. And, um, um, when you started, but for technical reasons, I could not really switch my mic. Um, uh, thank you all. We learned a lot really in this talk and uh, we are very honored and humbled to being able to be a part um, and parcel of this uh, show. And I uh, thank you. I'm still around. I'll still uh, listen to um, what Ms. Duff has to say. Thank you. For your work, we are very happy that you were able to join in uh later okay so now <clears throat> now we move to the question and answer session and i think um uh, justin or amy will uh, help me here because i guess uh, justin has uh, recorded or collected the questions to be addressed to uh, the speakers yeah do you have do you have the google doc we've added some questions there uh yes uh, i can see you mean let please. me put in let me put in chat thanks okay Les discussions là, oh, no. Oui, je vois les. Je suis en train de regarder. Oh, so um, here, okay. Let me uh, scroll them here. Uh, Non-video focus on. Okay. Thank you, Mary. Okay. I okay. Are, are you seeing the end of the chat, then, Andre? I put a question there. The, the end of the chat. But I just put a question in the chat. Yeah. Okay. Oh. But others should feel free to add to the q and I'm trying to, to check. Should I should I ask it then? Is that yeah. easier? Okay. Yeah, I think that would be easier. <laughs> Otherwise. So yeah, the, que the question is, what is the artist's role in making an impact toward peace? How can they have a broad societal impact to promote peace? This is what I am. Could you hear me? Yeah. Um, I... Out. But I cannot see the overt. Hmm. Oh, 
pourquoi la phase comique d'un événement permet de sortir de la phase tragique de la question. OK. So, um, this is just one question I can see to Professor Kamara. Mm -hmm. Kamara? Kamara? Professor Kamara? Prof. Kamara. Oui, c'est ça. Donc, je yeah, crois que yes. c'est la question. Je crois. Donc, c'est Dr. Jambley's question. La phase comique d'un comic phase of an event. How can it allow to getting out of the tragic phase? I use this um, code by Engels. Yes, it's going through. Yep. Yeah. Interpretation is going through. Yep. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Okay, so I can see that this was a code by Engels, where he was saying that history knows two phases, go through phases, the tragic phase of history and the comic phase of history. So, and then he said that the comic phase of history allows uh, humanity to get away, progressive from the tragic phase of history. So this is this quotation, this code I use um, uh, in, in order to talk about the illustration are um, uh, presented on the screen, where there's an eruption on the wall of Berlin with a hammer, where that wall is being uh, um, dismantled. There are also other pictures where we open, where the uh, um, wall is being uh, torn away, is being opened, and the picture that followed led to a monumental work of art devoted to the call for peace that I call the uh, wall of peace. Because in, in my talk, I said that the wall of Berlin was seen by uh, uh, Western countries as being the wall of shame. And um, that same wall was seen by Eastern as being a wall of peace. I was making this comparison in order to talk in the relation between the concept, uh, the very concept, and the um, and the work of peace. In other words, the work of peace is, uh, which is um, uh, produced, is not in line with the idea um, of that work of peace. Uh, this is what I wanted to illustrate. I think the tragic face of history cannot be uh, um, left out. Um, uh, but the artist is to look into that. You know, the Picasso, uh, Picasso's work of art, Guernica, um, uh, um, which came out in the bombardment in 1937 um, in Spain, in that uh, small bass city. Uh, and Picasso, as an artist, as a creator, um, uh, was inspired by uh, all these bombardments. And then he proposed this monumental work of art for peace, dedicated to work of peace, you know, for peace, and um, was trying to soften peace uh, hearts. There's also another piece by Ismail Jabati, which is in Bamako, which is targeted to martyrs. He's uh, got uh, inspiration from that crowd um, um, in 1991, the revolution of March in 1991, that led to um, uh, democracy in Mali. That work is now represented um, in the Bridge uh, um, uh, of Martyrs, I think. Uh, the, um, artists are there, they have inspiration, uh, the inspiration are um, uh, God given, but everything depends on the environment we live in. That's why I said that uh, art is a form of social conscience and we can only uh, achieve uh, uh, the work uh, based on the environment we live in. You cannot live in a society and live ind independent from that society. Artists really uh, exert that kind of role. This is what I can say uh, with respect to the question that was asked. Thank you. I don't know whether, um, um, can you, uh, could you hear me? Oh, thank you very much, Professor, for your answer. I hope Nando is satisfied with that, that answer, if he, if he hears me. There is another okay. question by um, Fatma Takeita. I think the question is uh, addressed to Philip, Philip Effion. So you can see the question, if peace cannot be achieved without justice, in Achibi and Brutus fiction, how is justice exercised in their work? Is it expressed in a form of poetic justice or as a form of utop utopia? Professor? 
Yeah, Good thank question. you. Thank you so much. I don't think it's it's expressed in the form of uh, a utopia. The the worlds of peace that they envisage is what are the kinds of worlds we should have as human beings. As human beings, we should not be resorting to violence and aggression and cruelty against other people. Um, so as as far and as far as the justice that you mentioned. Oh, the, the aspect of that question that has to do with uh, uh, justice. What these poets did is um, expose the problem. And in some cases, like in one of the poems by, uh, uh, by uh, Brutus, he talks about eventually defeating the brute, that that's where the uh, solution will come from. But before doing that, or in addition to doing that, he he, he presents in detail, in graphic detail, the ugliness of the problem. With Achebe, uh, he predominantly um, just presented the problem um, because the war, the Biafra war that I mentioned, the Nigeria Biafra war, it was one of the most horrific wars not just on the African continent, but in modern uh, history that we know little or nothing about. So just exposing the facts in itself was, uh, a, a, was, was a vision that people like uh, Achebe had. Now, the other thing a lot of these artists did is to be proactive. Uh, Dennis Brutus was, was an activist in uh, South Africa to the point that he was thrown in jail. And at a point, while he was actually actually spent time in Robin Island, where Ma Mandela spent time, and when he was trying to escape South Africa, at a point he was he was shot in the back. And during one of his visits to 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 Nigeria, when I was a student, um, he actually showed us the scar on his on his back. So that is one aspect. You know, they they represent the possibility of justice. Uh, but they also are proactive. They don't just stop with their writings. They actually became involved. And you'll see that with many artists like, like uh, Amiri Baraka, for instance, in the, uh, the African-American during the civil rights struggles. Um, I hope I've addressed the question. If not, we can still talk about it. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for your answer. So I hope um, Fatmata is uh, satisfied with that. And uh, I, any other question? Okay, if a question, for, or I can see Nando. Question to Balo. Uh, Balo, vous avez dit que l'artiste. Well, you said the artists have a role to play. Role to play uh, in looking for peace. Do you think that this role is well perceived ah. <laughs> by uh, all? Uh, Balo, vous voyez, vous voyez la, la oui. question? Balo, okay. can you read the question? Well, I believe. that the last, when Trist was saying that arts is good by nature in my presentation, the artist is meant to really consolidate peace, promoting peace. The artist has a role to play. That role is to move for peace. This is a must. The artist is against wars, conflicts, clashes, then want to promote evil. Artists always try to find a solution to a problem. When I talked about that young girl, she said that when she was young, she was seeing albinos being mistreated. And people would spit uh, albinos in the street. And when the pregnant woman, uh, she's going to uh, turn a blind eye so that her child will not be a bambino, things like that. So this is what she's been experiencing while she was a young person. So the search for her is to promoting those people, valuing, 
surprising these people that are really sidelined in society. These should be really um, considered as full-fledged citizens. And so when when she was 23 or 24, she works on the topic um, in her um, thesis. Uh, she um, pre prepared pictures trying to promote albinos to summarize all this um, uh, tragic issue. She's, she wanted to really promote these people, give value to these people so that they can be accepted by the population at large. Uh, she was targeting the um, global population um, to really sensitize people against uh, albinos, uh, rejection and discrimination. So I'm not saying that the artist uh, can promote pe uh, evil. This doesn't exist. Artists never promote evil. Maybe in the past, maybe for propaganda, you know, uh, motivations, etc. But but I think um, the artist has good heart. Really, is by nature good. The, the artists, uh, you know, artists are there to promote. Peace. I don't know whether I handled the question properly, uh, whether I was clear. Uh, thank you. Anyway, thank you. Miss or Miss Nando. Nando, can you hear us? I believe that um, you've been given the proper answers. Um, Nando is still uh, there following us. So there is another question by Abraham Mamela. How can artists, including African artists, connect with local audiences, but also spread their message globally? So uh, I don't know exactly to whom the question is uh, addressed, but uh, um, um, I guess any of you. Uh, okay. I'm a champion, uh, if, you, uh, if I may. Professor Ka of Camera. Yeah, I'll try anyway. I'll do my level best. Well, this question raised by Abraham uh, is in line with the last portion of uh, Nando's question. We said that not everybody can really interpret a uh, work of art. I think uh, that was his last um, portion. And, and this last question is it refers to applicant uh, public vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis, uh, works of pieces, uh, works of art that arts are creating. So um, those works of arts are established uh, through African inspiration, inspiration of African sources, so you may realize that the majority of uh, painters, African painters, uh, the younger generations are what we, what we call contemporary art. Uh, contemporary art is an abstraction that's been op operated in the field of art. And because of that, um, the works of art they're exhibiting are more read and more made, uh, they are more uh, digestible um, by a friend. Uh, groups when you organize an exhibition in Bamako, the majority of, um, uh, majority of people are coming to uh, see uh, those um, exhibitions are uh, Europeans. So these are uh, really, um, are not supposed to understand, but they have the money to buy those pieces, those works, works of art. So these uh, works of art are created for that market, that target group. So Western uh, critics uh, really urge younger uh, to um, abstract art. And they are really buying those works of art. So really, younger just are producing this kind of work, really, to make it more bank, more marketable. If you want to sell your works of art, you have to create for others. And that's that's a very critical question because in our country, in Africa, we're not creating for local groups, our community. We're not creating for Malian community. For those who are coming do not understand what we're creating. They say these artists are dreamers, they're crazy people, etc. And uh, so it's a really um, major issue. I've been saying that uh, the work of art should represent the content, the cultural content of the local uh, setting. And that's why um, um, I like uh, really mentioning a Senghor, Leopold Sedar Senghor from Senegal, who said that uh, Africa um, has to be entrenched uh, to uh, its Africanness and remain and should remain to the four winds of the world. I think the, um, uh, how Africans can really create for local markets, but still remain open for other um, markets as well. Uh, there's a notion uh, that we call globalization. And uh, there's a big art, a major art, art a major art uh, critic who said that globalization is uh, um, uh, kind of a recolonization. It's a metaphor 
uh, that's been quite um, um, being used. Uh, there's a major, I think, a to job from Senegal who said, in order to dominate uh, um, people, you have to um, uh, destroy their uh, culture. So Africans should really um, um, embody, uh, really, and protect their culture so they can really refer to their, um, refer their Africanness. And that's how they can be really listened to worldwide and not just uh, be uh, dominated by the Western world. That's what I'm saying. Also, um, uh, the forms of social conscience in Africa have to really reflect the aesthetic, which should not uh, really reflect Western aesthetics. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Kamara, for your answer. So, um, um, Kamara, well, I think that you got the translation. I don't need to come back. Uh, to explain it, but uh, in a context of globalization, we as Africans must be, or we must have our African touch in terms of arts. We must be deeply rooted in the African culture, but also open to the rest of the world. Thank you, Professor Kamara. Um, um, I think we have uh, no more questions here. Uh, Nando. Again, <laughs> uh, que monsieur peut expliquer plus clairement? Gentlemen, can he explain uh, clear? The Kuridugu, what's the role of Kuridugu in the quest for peace in Africa and Mali in particular? I don't know if it is uh, uh, for Kamara or for Balo to answer this question. So uh, Nando oh, wants no. to know the, uh, the meaning of the concept of Kiridugu and its role in uh, Kore, looking Kore, for Kore. peace in Africa and especially in Mali, in the quest of peace in Africa and especially in Mali. Kore Dugu. Kore Dugu. Yes. May I? Okay. Can I? Yes, please. Uh, thank you. I would like to, I told you during my uh, talk, I talked about a young person. In our society, we have secret societies that have different roles to play. Kuraduga, I believe, belongs to four or five ethnic groups the Nyakas, the Bambaras, the Sinufos, and uh, many other uh, tribal groups. These people uh, speak different languages, but they have the same approaches, exactly the same approaches in wherever they are located. They think the same way, same manner, they clothe the same way, they dress the same way. They have the same uh, dance rhythms, paces, styles, etc. So the Korandugas, these are, this is a social, uh, secret society, okay? Traditional secret society. Um, uh, they have wisdom rituals. These are people, they can really solve problems on a community level. This is their role, solving problems, clashes, addressing a community issue. When there's a conflict between various groups, they try to handle that in a peaceful manner, but they have their own way to doing it. And sometimes they can use comedy or drama. Uh, they're like, you know, um, comics. Uh, they use, uh, uh, they um, uh, dress in rags with um, pastel colors. With, they wear um, hats with um, uh, leathers. They wear um, bangles, etc. They want to be visible. That's how they um, are seen, how they are, um, present themselves. So uh, this is presented through sculptures, etc. So, so it's a community that teaches, um, uh, uh, that has an educational uh, scope. They educate uh, children. Um, so these uh, children are prepared for uh, their future roles as adults. Nando, um, um, I think um, if you can make it, uh, there's a book that uh, was published recently um, that is talking about this um, notion of Caragua. And um, no, I'll see where, if I can find it for you. And it talks about uh, really our uh, secret societies. Anyway, 
they are very strange in their um, really behaviors. It's in this bizarre, uh, really, attitude that they can really address and solve all clashes at community level. It's a kind of therapy, traditional African traditional therapy. They can cure lots of pathologies, diseases. They, they are not elected by such a large, but they are self-elected. Make a long story well, short. Thank you, Prof. Now, Nando, you have the opportunity to buy a book that you can, that is available at this level. You can find it with Balo. And now, let us uh, close this uh, question and answer session and uh, give the floor to Mary Duff for uh, closing remarks. Thank you. Hello, bonjour tout le monde. Good morning all, welcome. I'll switch to English so that I can make it snappy. I'm honored to be, sorry, switching into English again. Which is a daunting task because it can only be a very subjective um, reading of what I take from this very rich uh, conversation. Um, and I, the first take for me is really realizing the expensiveness of creativity. Um, and if we can call it African creativity with its many circulations and forms through the different art forms and, and media that the speakers have introduced us to. Um, and also to go back to Professor Kamara's notion of concept. So the different conceptions of peace um, in African art and how is peace reflected on. So I return the first to Professor Kamara's notion of art as a form of social consciousness, which is really the artist itself thinking about um, his or her relationship to a society, to a culture, to a set of practices and, and values and using creativity to give them new form and new meaning. I think that is first a very existential engagement with what the human is in relation to what we call community, society, or different institutional realms. So first piece there is between the individual, its society, its cultures, and thinking about himself or herself within a collective. And also I'm thinking of just how creativity and its relation also to movement. And this is very important at a time when we have um, very kind of turmoil <laughs> Um, a political, a very kind of contested political context in the Sahel to really um, know that movement and movement of people and also allowing that movement to foster a certain symbiosis between the spiritual and the physical world. I think through um, Dr. Safina Kimbokota's presentation about uh, Makonde art and its many manifestations, including like psychic um, notions and, and thinking about the connection between the spiritual and the physical world. And then I want to also think of peace for the artist. Does the artist create for peace or peace is peace inherent in the act of creating in creativity itself? And I think um, uh, Professor Balo tells us that actually peace is part of the process of artistic production and also thinking about what is peace in terms of excavating the memory and true and that is I think reflected also in uh, the um, Corredugo um, secret society but um, last but not least which is very important I think for our time it is the role of art in the, the project of constructing peace, maintaining cohesion 
in terms of restoring dignity. And here it is very important in terms of re restoring human dignity, rehumanizing individuals who are excluded. So in the project of Mademoiselle Nyare, the Albinism. Um, but more importantly, in terms of war, context of war um, and also conflict, we think of here, what is the role of peace? But how do we conceptualize peace? And here, Professor F. Young tells us that peace is futile without justice. So a condition for peace is really for the artist to think about a certain poetics of justice, the language of justice, especially when those creatives and, and artists are immersed in the horrendous experiences of war and especially war that involved nation building. So again, um, I thank everybody for sharing this very rich thought and I hope we'll retain peace as a form of social consciousness, peace as a condition for justice, but peace as an inherent artistic practice. So those three points stay with me. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you to all the participants. Um, if uh, Amy, Amy has something to say before, before we, we leave. Amy? Um, no, thank you. I think I'm, <laughs> I will leave it there. <laughs> okay. Okay. So thank you, everybody. Um, merci à tout le monde. Thank you all for being here. See you, you. in one of our next sessions.